Well, um, Stephen Covey, uh, a lot of you know that name, the author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It goes way back now. But he, he writes uh, a story about an experience he had that maybe some of you have heard of yourself. He says, um, I remember a mini paradigm shift I experienced one Sunday morning on a subway in New York. People were sitting quietly, some reading newspapers, some lost in thought, some resting uh, with their eyes closed. It was a calm, peaceful scene. Then suddenly, a man and his children entered the subway car. The children were so loud and rambunctious that instantly the whole climate changed. The man sat down next to me and closed his eyes, apparently oblivious to the situation. The children were yelling back and forth, throwing things, even grabbing people's papers. It was very disturbing, and yet the man sitting next to me did nothing. It was difficult not to feel irritated. I could not believe that he could be so insensitive to let his children run wild like that and do nothing about it, taking no responsibility at all. It was easy to see that everyone else on the subway felt irritated. So finally, with what I felt was unusual patience and restraint, I turned to him and said, Sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you couldn't control them a little more? The man lifted his gaze as if to come to a consciousness of the situation for the first time and said softly, oh, you're right. I, I guess I should do something about it. We just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago. I don't know what to think, and I guess they don't know how to handle it either. Covey writes, can you imagine what I felt at that moment? My paradigm shifted. Suddenly I saw things differently. I felt differently. I behaved differently. My irritation vanished. I didn't have to worry about controlling my attitude or my behavior. My heart was filled with the man's pain. Feelings of sympathy and compassion flowed freely. Your wife has died? Oh, I'm so sorry. Can you tell me about it? What, what can I do to help? Covey writes, everything changed in an instant. Today, as we wrap up our series entitled Update Available, I want to talk with you about update number three, your view of others. Your view of of others. And as Covey's story shows us, so often we are viewing people through a faulty or incomplete lens. I'll never forget going with my oldest son when he was just a, a little boy uh, with my wife, and I think he was just barely, you know, barely out of toddler stage at that point, but we knew that he needed help with his vision. It seemed that way, even though the, the pediatrician couldn't really determine anything based upon their test. We were like, no, something's up here. And so there we are in the ophthalmologist's office, and, and, and the ophthalmologist is just getting a little irritated. And he's getting frustrated, and he's just saying there, you know, Landon, just, you know, sit down. You know, like, like tell me what's on the screen there. And, you know, and he just felt that Landon was just this in, inattentive, you know, rambunctious child in that moment who didn't want to focus in and pay attention to what was on the screen. And as he ran more tests and did more things, finally, he came to realize that Landon was struggling more than even he, as the eye doctor, imagined to see what was on the screen. And all of a sudden, when he came to realize that, it was like the eye doctor's entire demeanor just changed. It just changed. It's ironic, isn't it, that he was actually looking at my son through a faulty lens. And that caused him to end up treating him in a way in that moment that really he shouldn't have. Fast forward now years later to maybe just about a year and a half ago, there we are at the optometrist and picking up the eyeglass prescription for him. You know, he had been wearing glasses now for years upon years. And, 
and uh, went to get the updated prescription. And there, as we come back in the car after waiting in the store and waiting in the store and waiting in the store for so long, I said, well, how do they feel? How do they feel? And he's like, I don't know, you know. And he just said that something's not right. I took the glasses, looked through them myself, knowing that one of the lens should have appeared a certain way to me, even without my prescription being the same as his. And I said, something's wrong here. Something's wrong. As I brought them back into the store after we had waited for so long, it turned out they had put the wrong prescription lens into the glasses. Of course he couldn't see correctly. He was looking through a faulty lens. How often it is that you and I are doing the same thing. But unlike my son, we don't even realize it. We don't even realize it. We're looking at others around us, seeing them, making judgment calls on them, and we're looking through a faulty lens, and we don't even realize it. As we come to Genesis chapter 4, we not only enter into the very first chapter of the Bible that covers the story of humanity after its fall, but we also enter into a chapter that gives us a snapshot of a world where humanity's view of others has become more and more distorted, more and more off. That that, in turn, we see leads to a more and more distorted treatment of others, even a mistreatment of others that turns fatal. Picking up at verse 1 of chapter 4, we read, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know. He replied, am I my brother's keeper? Let's pause in the text. I'll encourage you to read the rest on your own. Father, thank you for your word. As you're here, Holy Spirit working, would you take your word, the sword of the Spirit, and drive it into our souls today, that we would never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I can't help but wonder How in the world could Cain do this to his own brother? Now, I had some fights with my brother that was closest to me in age growing up, guilty of even giving a black eye at one point. And we, you know, we did a lot of things. I went crashing through windows. We did all sorts of things, wrestling and fighting with each other. But for Cain to kill his brother premeditated murder, to say the least. And I begin to wonder if there's not in this passage some clues as to what often takes place within the heart of humanity, how our treatment, listen, our treatment of others is directly impacted by our view of others. Please hear me, because it's as fresh as the news this morning once again. Our treatment of others is directly impacted by our view of others. So that when we begin to see others as less deserving than us, or as the reason for our struggles, 
The reason for our poverty, the reason for our lack of success or the lack of peace in our lives, we can end up excusing all sorts of attitudes and behaviors toward them. Isn't that right? After all, we say, oh, they're the ones to blame for my mess. They're the ones to blame for my issues. They're the real problem, we say, when in fact, folks, the real problem might be right smack in the mirror. Right smack in the mirror. In fact, before we know it, we can begin to view them as almost subhuman, as something rather than as someone, and begin to treat them in ways that we would never, never want to be treated ourselves. In fact, notice the flow of events in our passage there in Genesis 4. We read once again, The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. Notice firstly that our view of others is often impacted by the fact that you're dealing with personal frustration and disappointment. You're dealing with personal frustration and disappointment. Unmet dreams, maybe unmet expectations. You were hoping things were going to go one way when in fact they went another. Listen, we can begin to talk about why Abel's offering was more favorable to God than Cain's. We'll, we'll hold that off for another conversation, even though it's all part of the text here. But the point that I want to focus on is that there was, I believe, as a result, great disappointment and frustration on the part of Cain. There just had to be. There had to be. Cain might have envisioned God honoring his offering and maybe elevating him to, as one of the guys, in, you know, where I used to work, used to say, you know, it's sort of the golden boy status. The golden boy status. And, you know, somehow that, that he would have been the one to, well, I know it brings back uh, memories not too long ago. He would have been the one to get the Oscar, you know, to get the Oscar. That's an inside joke for the church here. He didn't get the Oscar. He didn't get the Oscar. And as a result, listen, a downward spiral began in his heart and mind, and his view of his brother began to change. His view of his brother began to change, and you know, not for the better. Not for the better. You see, you might think, my view of others, how I see others, has nothing to do with how things are going in my own life. Oh, no? No, how, no, my view and how I see others has nothing to do whether or not things are going well for me. And I, I wouldn't be so quick to assume that. I would not be so quick to assume that. And I won't give you the saying about the word assume. Let me ask you, how do you view that other woman when she seems to have it all together and your life seems to be falling apart? How do you view that other woman when she seems to have it all together going for her? And your life seems to be falling apart. How do you view that other man when he's driving your dream car and now you're barely making ends meet? You're barely making ends meet. You see, we would do ourselves and everybody else a service if we would deal honestly with our frustrations and disappointments with our failures, our unmet expectations and dreams rather than burying them or allowing them to somehow harbor within us. So let me encourage you, please, talk to God. Anytime, anywhere, you can do it. Talk to God about your frustrations, about how you're feeling about your failures, about the things, the dreams that you had for your life, how things were going to go, and now they're totally not going that way. Talk to God. Listen, the Bible is full of people talking to God about their disappointments, their unmet expectations and failures. The Bible's full of people like that, conversations with God where people are being real to God. Please, we talk about, the, the for the church here, that our... our our mission is to help real people experience real life in Jesus. We don't want you coming in and putting on some sort of Sunday mask. Uh, a lot of you are choosing to wear a mask, but that's a different type of mask. We, we, we cannot grow in Christ unless we're real with him and real with each other. It will forever stunt your growth. 
And it, it will be a horrible witness to the people around us because they're always thinking, I, I can't even be a follower of Jesus because I can't be like those people. They're too, they're too perfect. And meanwhile, it's like, no, we're not. We're real people with real issues and problems and struggles, but we're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus. Please talk to God. But also remember, and you'll hear this from me uh, multiple times, talk to somebody in your life. Talk to a godly, trusted individual that you can that you can go to who can help you to work through those things, those disappointments. Maybe, maybe they're disappointments in your marriage. Maybe they're disappointments with your children, how things have gone. Maybe they're disappointments at your job and your family. Maybe in ministry, disappointments and frustrations in church. Yeah, in church. Wherever it might be. This is why we have, by the way, Something called soul care ministry is to help people walk through issues and to come to a place of healing, come to a place of freedom. But it's not just in soul care. It's also, again, God giving us trusted, trusted godly individuals in our lives. Listen, you might think that your unfulfilled hopes and dreams are only affecting you, but they could very well be affecting how you're seeing and relating to everybody else around you. You might not even think it. Because you might be thinking, no, 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 that can't be me. Because, you know, I, I love Jesus. Yes, I do. I love Jesus. How about you? You know, you might, be, you might be saying, you know, I love Jesus and I'm a follower of him. And no, that, that can't be me. No, no, I've been baptized and I, I've been even filled with the Spirit. I even speak in other tongues. That can't be me. But listen, you and I, we can still end up being people who are having a terrible time relating with others in a healthy manner because every time we look at them, we're, 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 we're still you know, seeing them through the frustration and the failures of our own lives. It could be our own spouse. It could be our own family. It could be other people in the church that you're seeing them through the lens of personal frustration and disappointment and it's time to be real about it with yourself, with God, and with others. Remember though, Remember, things might not have gone the way that you planned or you hoped or dreamed in your life, but never forget that we serve a God who is able to take even the toughest disappointments in life and make from them something more beautiful than you and I could have ever imagined or dreamed. How many of you know we serve a God who makes beauty from ashes? Amen? Beauty from ashes. Beauty from ashes. By the way, uh, seamless, there's part of your answer to your question regarding the resurrection. He makes beauty from what? Ashes. Oh, we'll just keep going from there. Notice that your second, again, the, the second thing that can impact us in our view of others is the fact that you and I can be blinded by jealousy and envy. Blinded by jealousy and envy. Again, we read, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. You must master it. Notice the flow in our text. Notice the flow, how Cain went from being this person with unmet expectations and disappointment to then becoming filled with an anger that was fueled by jealousy and envy of his brother. Now, I, I don't know about you, I usually use jealousy and envy quite interchangeably. I use them pretty much to mean the same thing. Anybody with me? That that's sort of how you end up doing it? You know, again, yeah, but others have noted that there's actually a marked difference between them. On one PhD, Dr. Richard Smith says it this way, envy is when we lack a desired attribute enjoyed by another. Whereas jealousy is when something we have is threatened by a third person. Others have said, it's, you know, envy is to bear a grudge towards someone due to, again, we know what the Tenth Commandment is of the Big Ten, so the, the Big Ten words, commandments, principles, however, you know, it's coveting, right? Thou shalt not covet, right? Again, it's bearing a grudge towards someone uh, due to coveting what that person has or enjoys. 
It's the emotion you feel when someone, uh, again, has a possession that you want. They have something that you want. Jealousy, on the other hand, is the emotion when you fear you may be replaced in the affection of someone that you love or desire. It means being apprehensive, even vengeful, vengeful out of fear of being replaced by someone else. We talked about it several weeks ago. God's the only one who is jealous in the perfect way because his jealousy is never based on insecurities, but is always based on a perfect love for you and me, a perfect love. So when you look at our text, though, you begin to realize that Cain, Cain was dealing with both really jealousy and envy. Jealousy and envy. He was perhaps fearful that Abel was going to be the favorite one from now on. God looked favorably at his offering. God looked favorably at Abel's sacrifice, at his offering. Not Cain's. And, and perhaps Cain was fearful that somehow he was maybe going to get knocked out of the beloved firstborn position, so to speak. Again, he's, he's, he's jealous. And at the same time, he was envious of the favor and blessing that Abel received from God. He was envious of him. And before we know it, Cain is looking at his own brother through this lens of jealousy and envy, and it proves to be nothing short of dangerous. But this isn't just about Cain and Abel, is it? I hope you realize it's not. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This is about how you and I can end up viewing people through a lens that I would call cracked. Not in the way my sons use the words cracked now. Cracked by jealousy and envy. A lens that's cracked by jealousy and envy. Where we begin to view others from a position of fear and insecurity. Where we get sucked into playing the never-ending uh, comparison game. Why does she get a family like that? Why did he get that office? Why does... She have a marriage like that. Why, why, does, why does he get the raise? Why did they get into that school and not me? Why did they get that role, that position, and not me? It's funny that I'm actually quoting Bette Midler here, but she's credited with saying, the worst part of success is trying to find someone who is happy for you. What's truth is truth. I don't really care about the source, so to speak, if it's true. Meanwhile, God's desire is that you and I would rejoice with those who rejoice. Amen. And that we would mourn with those who mourn. Yes. I'll put it this way. God's desire is that we would find great peace contentment and a humble confidence in who he has made us to be as well as a joy in who he's made others to be and how he's chosen to bless them. Amen. This is God's desire for us. Mm -hmm. So that we would be able to say sincerely, man, I am so happy for him. She is, she's incredible. I can't believe, man, the gifts and the skills that God has given her. To, uh, man, I, I can't believe how good he is at that. That is so amazing. Praise God. Praise God for the way God uses her. Praise God for the way God uses him. Folks, let me just put it all out there right now. The people that have the worst time with this, you ready, are pastors. Pastors. I might just be a little biased in saying that, but I feel like I can take the shot because I'm a pastor. It's that flesh side of you that constantly battles when you have people doing what you're doing right now and having to look this way and having to almost impress or perform and then find somebody else who 
he does it so much better than me. That's because he's not preaching God's word. He's getting those crowds because he's using some, something else they're, they're doing, but they're not, they're not really preaching the gospel. Man, it's hard for us, isn't it, to be able to go, she's just better than me. He is just blessed with just a larger portion of grace by God in this area than me. Praise God for the way that he just distributes his gifts abundantly. But differently. But differently. Yeah, we have a terrible time. We have a terrible time, and I just, I just put myself out there, just saying, myself, we as pastors. It's something that we, we want to say, you know, I must become greater, and they must become less. No, John the baptizer said, he must become greater, and I must become less. May that be our mantra in everything we do individually and as a church. It's not about this church's name. It always has to be about his name, Amen. his name. He must become greater. We must become less. We must become less. You see, the lens through which you see yourself has a great impact on how you see others. So if you're letting your insecurities run the show, you will constantly see others as competition, as someone who's somehow in opposition to you. But when you see yourself through God's eyes, somebody say God's eyes, God's eyes, then and only then you'll be able to properly see others for who they are. And you'll rejoice in that because you know who you are. You know who you are. And it's then that you're able to rejoice going, you know what? Huh. I, am, I am so happy for her. I'm so happy for him. And you can say that regardless of how much better Bigger, blessed, or beautiful they might be. Praise God. Praise God. Easier talk than walked. Somebody say, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Why do you think Jesus walked with such a perfect view and discernment of others? You say, well, it's the Holy Spirit just at work with him, within him without measure. Yeah, yeah, I get that part, of course. I get that part of theology. But I'll also add this to it. One of the reasons was that he knew exactly who he was and is in relationship to his heavenly father. He knew exactly who he was and is. And by the way, that was exactly the opposite of the MO of the religious leaders around him. Exactly the opposite. So that the Bible tells us that the Roman governor, even Pilate, knew that it was out of, the Bible tells us, out of envy out of envy that the religious leaders had it out for Jesus. Had it out. They were definitely operating from a place of fear, insecurities, all these worries and anxieties. You see, their anger was fueled by their jealousy and envy of Jesus. The question is, what about you? What about you? What about you? What is your identity ultimately based on? Is it your GPA? Your GPA. Really, that's what your identity is really based on. Someday when you stand before God in eternity, he's going to ask you, what was your GPA, my child? <laughs> that's really. What's your identity based on? The name of the school that you got into? Really. But Pastor John, you don't understand all my friends. It's this big thing. Okay, fine. I get it. Welcome to the world. Welcome to having to come back to God's word and base our lives on his truth. His truth. What he has to say about you and me. What's important to him. What's your identity ultimately based on? Is it how many letters come after your name? How many figures are in your income? Because until you realize that God loves you for you, turn to your neighbor and say, for you, he loves you for you, not for what you do, not for how much you make, not for how well you perform. God loves you for you. 
Unless you and I realize that we will always see ourselves through a faulty lens and that in turn will cause us to see others in the same way, not as God's special creation endowed with unbelievable gifts, but as someone who's trying to take our spot. As someone who's trying to push us out. And that, my friend, can lead to damaging results. Damaging. If you're dealing with jealousy and envy today, please, Please call it for what it is. Jealousy, envy, sin. Call it for what it is. Bring it to God before it hurts not only you, but everybody around you. For the sake of your marriage, for the sake of your children following your path, for the sake of your church, for the sake of this church, for the sake of the work of Christ, deal with it. Repent of it. Bring it to Jesus. And once again, dealing with it might very well mean having others in your life be uh, an, an objectionable or objective, excuse me, objective viewpoint on your life, on what's happening, on what they see in you. A trusted individual that loves you and loves God and that can help you to walk through it and work through it. Again, I'll point you to our soul care ministry as one source for help in that. God wants you free. God wants you healed. God, God wants you whole. Can you say amen? amen? Finally, your view of others can be distorted as you're consumed with anger and rage. Our text again, Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Please, do not think this is just a story. Please hear me. Do not think this is just a story. A story. It is real. More than that, this is a warning. Yeah. This is a warning. That's what God was doing. He was giving you and me a warning. Mm -hmm. A warning, folks. This is more true to life than any of us would care to admit. Some of us have loved ones, family members, people in our lives that have fallen into the deepest anger and the deepest rage and it led to the most disastrous results. I'm talking about how our warped view of God and ourselves can ultimately produce a warped view of others that can produce, that can result in anything. Do you understand? Anything. We look at the stories, and we say, I, I can't even imagine how that happened. And God is saying us, to us in his word, I'm going to tell you how it happens. Watch as it unfolds. Watch. For Cain, it resulted in murder. But may I remind you what Jesus said. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, can you read the words in yellow with me, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or a sister, racha, a term of insult, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Notice what Jesus closes out with. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in the front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. I can't help but ask, what would it, what would it have been like if Cain heeded the warning that God had given him. And he poured out his heart before the Lord. God had warned him, if you do what is right, Cain, 
Will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Cain, it's ready to pounce on you. It's going to chew you up. It's going to spit you out. But you've got to make a decision. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, desires to have you. But you, Cain, you must master it. You must make a decision. You can't let it rule you. You need to rule over it. What if Cain had heeded the warning? My mind goes fast forward to Genesis 33, where these two brothers that had been at odds for so long, there was so much anger and hatred and division between them, but we get this scene that Esau not takes out his rage on his brother Jacob after years and years have gone by, but he hugs him and he kisses him. We fast forward to the very ending of Genesis, where this brother who had been sold into slavery where he suffered so much, he didn't end up making his brothers suffer, but he loved them and poured blessings upon them. His name was Joseph. But here we are. Here we are, still in Genesis 4. What if, what if Cain poured out his heart before the Lord? repented of his jealousy and envy, again, repented of his anger toward his brother and the rage that was just boiling within. And he went to his brother Abel and he said, bro, bro, I, I, gotta, I gotta be real with you. I've been angry with you. And I'm so sorry. It's been wrong. It's been festering within me. It wasn't your fault. I, I saw how God blessed you and how, how you just gave God your best. And I was angry at you, and I wanted to be you. I wanted to be you. But I wasn't you. What if? What if he said to him, I'm so sorry, Abel. I'm so sorry. I want to confess it to you, and I, I want to be real with you. I need to be accountable to you, brother. That's not the way it played out, though, was it? Jealousy and envy rolled out a red carpet for anger, rage, and hatred to come in. And it wasn't long before Cain just unleashed the fullness of his anger upon Abel, no longer seeing him as his brother, but seeing him as his enemy. Do you understand what our spiritual enemy would love to do in a church whether this church or in any church, and many of us have passed through those waters already. He would love for you and I to see our brothers and sisters, not as brothers and sisters in Christ, but as enemies. Might I even state maybe the oxymoron, enemies in Christ. Enemies in Christ. But how often it's played out. It's like you can just read the script, and it seems to just play out time and again the same way. It's an ancient script, and so many want to play a part in this play. Isn't that why the Bible warns, saying, be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Give no place, as many versions will interpret it in sort of paraphrase, give no foothold to the devil. Folks, when you and I, when, when you hold on to your anger towards someone, you're, you're not hurting them. Oh, you might end up hurting them. But you're not hurting them. That's right. You're, you're, you're hurting yourself firstly and foremostly. As others have said, right? That bitterness and rage and anger you have towards someone else is like a cocktail that you're preparing and stirring for someone else to drink. But you yourself drink down the poison. You're hurting firstly and foremostly yourself. Everything else is just an effect of it. Everything else is a byproduct. You're opening the door for your spiritual enemy to walk right into the house of your heart as he consumes your thinking and wraps your perspective up with that person that now you, you disdain them, you loathe them. 
And before you know it, they've become less and less of a person in your eyes and more and more of a thing to be disposed of and taken out of the way. Some of you remember the story years ago. Journalist Melanie Lawson tells it this way. It was January 31st, 1991, when the news of a Channel View mother arrested for hiring a hitman in an effort to land her daughter a spot on the cheerleading squad shocked the Houston community. And you thought your school tryouts were tough. Wanda Holloway, 37, was charged with trying to hire a man to kill the mother of her daughter's cheerleading rival. The intended victim was Verna Heath, the mother of Amber Heath. Amber had been a cheerleader at Alice Johnson Junior High School. According to police, Holloway apparently thought if Amber's mother was killed, she would be too distraught to try out for cheerleader, making it easier for Holloway's daughter, Shanna, to make the squad. Holloway went to her former brother-in-law, Terry Harper, to help arrange the hitman deal, but Harper contacted the sheriff's department, thank God, when Harper and Holloway met at a Pasadena motel to seal the deal, their conversation was recorded and Holloway later arrested and charged with solicitation of capital murder. The whole case went on in a whole rigmarole way. I'll leave the details to you. You might say that woman was sick. And I would say, absolutely. Totally agree. Because any time Anytime we treat and see another human being as a dispensable thing rather than a person, we are sick. We are sick. We're sick with sin. We're sick with sin. But that's exactly what happens when we allow our hearts and minds to become blinded by jealousy and envy that quickly turns into an all-consuming anger, whether it's toward an individual. Folks, listen or toward a group of people, toward a group of people. We no longer see or treat God's image bearers as the special creations that they are. What about you? Is there a person that you've been angry toward? I mean, really angry toward. It doesn't take much, folks. It doesn't take much. I'm talking about the type of anger where, honestly, if you were truthful, and God totally sees it in you, and me anyway, that you actually wouldn't mind if something happened to that person. You wouldn't mind. They deserve it anyway, you think. She has it coming to her. He has it coming to him. Maybe you've been angry toward a group of people, and the way that you talk about those people those people is evidence just where your heart is. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You might say, but John, you don't understand what she did to me. You don't understand what he did to me. You don't understand how they hurt me. You don't understand how those people treated my family. You don't understand. And I'd say, you're right, I don't, but God does, Amen. God does. And the very one who watched his one and only son be mistreated, brutally beaten, and crucified for crimes he did not commit is the same God and Father who heard his only son cry out on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And folks, Jesus was not only giving up his life for our sins, but the Gospels are clear. He was giving us an example to follow. The New Testament is very clear, and the early church knew that. Would you hear me? The early church knew that, so much so that the dying words of the very first martyr of the church named Stephen were these, Lord do not hold this sin against them. They knew this was more than just Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. This was Jesus blazing a path for us to follow. This was Jesus showing us how we are to act toward our enemies. 
You see, even in the midst of his mistreatment there, Stephen knew that, that he was to treat his persecutors in, in a way that was different. And he saw them not as those whom he wanted to get vengeance upon. He saw them still as those whom he wanted to see saved, rescued from the wrath, the judgment of God. His view of them as those whom God loved and who God sent his son for did not change based upon their treatment of him. What about you? Do you need an update today? We've been talking through this series about an update available, an update that God wants to give us an updated view of himself, an updated view of ourselves, and, and today an updated view of others. There's an update available. Would you stand with me across this room? Team, would you come? Thank you. For some of you, receiving God's update means finally receiving, please come, finally receiving God's updated view of yourself, finally seeing yourself through God's eyes. For others, it's finally, it's finally receiving God's gift of love and grace in Jesus into your life personally, even as Evelyn and Claudia and Karen today just celebrated in. It's receiving his love and grace personally in your life. It's an update that God wants you to download in your soul. For some of you today, it's coming to terms with the fact of who you are and who you're not. One man has even written about the gift of limitations that God has given us. And it's okay. It's okay to be able to say, praise God. Praise God for the way he's made him or her. And you know what? I don't have those gifts and, and that's okay. It's okay. It's coming to terms with who you are and who you're not. And that's a healthy, healthy, godly step in being able to receive an updated view of ourselves and others. For some of you, it's, it's calling the jealousy, the anger and rage in your heart for what it is. It's confessing them today as sin and saying, God, I, I don't want to continue to give way to the, to the acts of my flesh, that sinful nature in me, of this jealousy, this, this rage, and this, this envy in my heart, God. And today is a day where God's saying it's time to make a turn. It's time to turn from them. It's time to confess them and experience his healing, his forgiveness, his freedom in your life. It's repenting from them and finding forgiveness in Christ. For some of you today, it's going to be a day where, as I call you just to begin to come, that God's just saying it's time for you to start praying and start praying his blessings on those that have hurt you. Praying his blessings on those that have mistreated you. For some of you, it will be, it will be saying, no, I, I can't go to this altar right now. I need to send a text message to somebody first. I need to make things right. I, I need to send an email to somebody right now as I sit in my pew. I, I need to go to somebody in this room and make things right and say I'm sorry. Folks, sometimes it could be because of a person's slander of us. Sometimes it could be because of their success. But we have allowed jealousy and envy and anger and all sorts of things to take root in our hearts and lives. And I pray today would be a day where you turn from them. As Kivian and the team just lead us in this song in just a moment, I'm just going to invite you to come. Just find a place just to pray, maybe standing, maybe kneeling, maybe sitting. Just spend some time talking to God spread out here. You can just take this time, if you're watching online, that you would do business wherever you are, wherever you are. Being real with God, receiving God's grace and love and forgiveness in Jesus today. However you fit into this, would you recognize today, God, I need a change, I need an update, and it starts in here. It starts in here. Would you come as Kivian leads us in this song? Thank you.
supply God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again Set me on fire, set me on fire Take all I have in these hands and multiply God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again set me on fire set me on fire here i am God. arms wide open pouring out my life gracefully broken Your purpose for me, you won't forsake me, you will be with me. Here I am, God, arms wide open, pouring out my life, grace. Make it your prayer across this room. Holding nothing back. Come on, he wants the best of you and he wants the worst of you. Holding nothing. He wants the ugliest back. sin, the ugliest envy, jealousy. He wants us to give him all, all of our disappointment and our frustration. All that anger, all that rage. Give it to him. I surrender. Come on, give it to him. No holding back. No holding back. Offer it up to him. Here I am, God, arms wide open. Nobody can pray this prayer for you. Pouring out my life, gracefully broken. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wide open. 
pour it out. Pour it out. Pouring out my life, gracefully broken. We thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you for meeting with us today. Thank you for the work that you're doing in hearts and lives. God, all throughout this service today, both here and online, Lord, thank you. God, we stand in awe of you. We thank you for allowing us the privilege to be in your house and be able to face, Lord God, your word. And Lord, not simply walk away from your word today. But Lord, to see ourselves in light of your word, God. And to ask you and allow you to make the changes that you want to make in our hearts and lives. And to help us to do our part. We thank you, Lord. God, may we see others, God, the way that you want us to see them. These altars will remain open as others are praying. Please be mindful of that. Stay as long as you want. Come if you need special prayer. Let me bless you. Just be mindful of those that are praying. Now go, as God's word says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. The Lord be with you. Please be mindful of those praying and know if you need prayer, others will be here to pray with you. God bless you.